And just this week, Karina, you opened the Sarsak Museum in Beirut, which is the reason why you're not with us in person. I hope it went really well. Um, I know you've worked very hard towards it. The Sarsak Museum in Beirut is an emblematic modern and contemporary museum in Beirut. And after three years of forced closure, following different crises, as we've spoken about, and cumulating in the Beirut port explosion, the museum is since yesterday, I believe, able to welcome the public again. Congratulations on that, Karina. So Karina El Lelou is the new director of the Central Institution, which has been active for 62 years. You embody this forceful image of culture as an act of resistance. You speak about your team as heroes. Can you share with, with us what you mean about culture as an act of resistance? Well, thank you, for first of all, for organizing this uh, conference, because um, today for us in Beirut, it was a healing process yesterday to reopen the museum. It was terribly damaged after the explosion of the 4th of August. And we saw 55 artworks damaged, the stained glass that uh, is emblematic for our architecture was destroyed, and many people were traumatized in our team, and actually many left. The, we are reopening the museum in the country and knowing the biggest economic crisis. It's a society of survivors. I always say Lebanon today, the Lebanese are survivors because we have seen the biggest non-nuclear blast that we will never ever forget. And seeing this massive destruction was, uh, I think, uh, an event that will be uh, marking our lives forever. So yesterday, we reopened the doors of the museum with our international partners who helped us, France, Italy, and uh, Alif, who are specialized in uh, protecting art in conflict zones. So there are many angels for the heritage in uh, endangered space, uh, spaces like ours. And we were able to see 4,000 people who came yesterday and many, many young people people so that was just a beautiful evening we saw that we are resisting and this is what i always say you know whatever tried to kill us uh didn't and uh of course we reopened the museum with uh, no budget with very little electricity from the public government so we all run on our generators we installed a solar panel in order to reduce our consumption and I say yesterday, in many of my interviews, it is really an act of resistance to reopen for the fourth time, because, of course, Lebanon went through many cycles of crisis. You talk about culture being needed more than ever um, when everything is collapsing. Can you talk to us about that? I can definitely tell you, if you were here yesterday, it was the perfect illustration of this. Our country now facing the most difficult period because after you know the blast, the COVID, we don't have a president right now running our government. Uh, we don't have any uh, practically system. Uh, seeing a running museum that is a place of peace, of freedom, of expression, because we have invited many different voices. On We have five exhibition halls, and we have invited um, activists, we have invited uh, creators to really also talk about our idea of borders. You know, in Lebanon, we have many uh, issues with our borders, and many, uh, when, when the cartography was done in Lebanon, many... Uh, 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 <clears throat> spaces in the south of Lebanon weren't defined, so there, there are a lot of legal issues with, with our land, and we have uh, been reflecting on our own history, so we created an exhibition on our history uh, of the modern art in Lebanon, but a, as well the context, how artists responded to the context, and how actually, as you said, very often we think that art 
and artists live in a bubble. And we did a whole exhibition to explain that it's not the case, especially in a place of crisis. You see that artists are citizens like everyone else. They go through the same problems and they create art as a need. It is a basic need, human need to create and to express yourself and feel safe expressing yourself. And this is what we are offering in our museum. It's a free, it's a space where you feel safe, first of all, to express who you are without being judged. Secondly, you are, you are a creative person, you can express yourself. And then we can create a platform for dialogue in a society where the political dialogues have not been able to solve anything. And that yesterday we saw the new generation, which is completely different. And I hope that, you know, our museum can build and, and count on, uh, on the new generations. And we absolutely are developing an educational program to be able to create this real platform of dialogues. Thank you, Karina. Sonia, I'd love to turn to you now. Um, you've been working with the Kuna tribe, the last indigenous community of the Caribbean, to build the Guna Museum, which you'll tell us about. Because of the damage at sea level and violent rains, um, the Gunas only have 10 years left on their island before they are forced to relocate to the mainland. So they will be climate refugees very shortly. You've been working to safeguard their heritage. Yeah. What's the significance of safeguarding indigenous culture in today's world? So thank you to receive me during this conference and to organize this. So um, I lived during six months in immersion with the last tribe of the Caraibes, the Gunas. So um, when you live in immersion with them, you understand the different problem, climate problem. So you understand that um, the sea level, so you're gonna understand that, um, that in less than 10 years, this island gonna disappear. So um, San Blas, it's a comarca between Colombia and Panama, 375 beautiful islands. They live in harmony with the nature. So they don't have electricity. They have only solar panels. They are fishermen. So um, at this moment, you understand and you see, they explain to you that the problem. So with the plastic, with the sea level. And at this moment, you ask at yourself question because they're gonna be like refugee climate. So uh, they're gonna have to move on the continent. And you ask at yourself question, what they're gonna do? Where are they gonna do? Where are they gonna go? So, and how are they gonna protect their uh, heritage? How are they gonna protect their culture? How are they gonna transmit to the next generation? So at this moment, we create the Legacy Forum organization. We promote and transmit the heritage of the indigenous communities. And we decide to play the, the job of the government to rebuild the museum in the San Blas, in la Isla de la Comunidad. So with sustainable material, um, because it's really important to understand one thing, it's when you understand that indigenous communities is 5% of the world population, but they protect 80% of the biodiversity. You understand that um, to protect the indigenous communities is to protect the earth, and to protect the earth is to protect the humanity. So we are all connected. So we, are, we have all this um, job, this action to play, individual action, but only with solidarity. So with all the um, competence, with different competence, we work with the Plastic Odyssey, to rebuild the museum, we start in October 2023. And it's really important to understand that the heritage, the culture, the um, communities are the, um, the humanity. So what is culture? Finally, it's art, it's a linguistic, it's a, um, it's a writing. So we have to protect this heritage for, uh, for the next generation. And what... <laughs> What are some of the values in the indigenous culture that you have been in contact with that you think can be relevant to the broader, the broader world that we live in? Oh, they, they live in harmony with the nature. So um, we, we have to take this inspiration, this inspiration that to, to the respect of the nature. So they have these values, they have ancestral values, really important to them um, because finally it's the world. So um, to transmit these values about 
the, the linguistic, about the, um, the writing, about their artisanal culture. I think we can make like a real wake up call with the cur about curiosity across art. So it's what is reason we work with the um, director of documentaries, with photographers, to organize exhibitions around the world, to, um, to protect their heritage. So uh, we transmit this heritage across art. Thank you for presenting your work. I'd love to turn to you, Max, now. So in 2018, we've all heard about it. The mega fire campfire ravaged paradise, a place in California, in four short hours. Armed with an infrared slide film, you went to meet and hear the survivors who tried to rebuild their lives at both the material and immaterial level. You navigate documentary and fiction, and you say that the tale of paradise gives us a glimpse at the next place that will have to go through healing after a disaster. You define your work as speculative documentary. So when the support systems fail, art can be there. Max, this comes from you. You shared with me that you think it's up to all artists to choose their positioning, their place of action. Can you tell me more about this questioning and about choosing your own place of action through art? Thanks very much, Charlotte, for this introduction, and thank you for uh, inviting me uh, to talk today about uh, this very important topic. Um, yes, I'd like to reference a little bit uh, what Pascal said in the beginning. Um, when you're a photographer, you have to choose uh, how do you represent the reality around you, and uh, it's not always showing the visible. Uh, because um, there's an obvious and immediate, uh, you know, urgency to show what's going on, but also there's, there are many things in the world that are not visible, and photography has this particularity that you can actually suggest it. It's a, it's a very sensitive kind of medium, and uh, that's why the work that I do, uh, as you said, I try to describe it in a way that conveys that. And a speculative documentary for me is a way to show what can happen uh, in those big questions, um, not just what's going on today, but what do we do next? Uh, that's my line of work. Of work. That's why when this town, uh, when I heard about this town and what people were doing, like trying to rebuild it, uh, I decided I wanted to hear about why they wanted to go back and settle there again and how did they feel about it? How did they feel about it? So I tried to let the audience feel, feel uh, what they went through and what was this kind of uh, ordeal that they, they lived and uh, what their questions were. So um, it's an important uh, moment that you, you cannot see the, the, the flames after the disaster, but how do you transmit that to someone who's not been there? And how, do you, uh, how can you capture a little bit this emotion, that the, 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 this anguish, this fear they have when they rebuild their town, knowing that every year now fires and uh, come really close to this town because there are like two, more than 200 fires, wildfires every year in California. Um, and in 2021, and when I was uh, there working on the story, uh, the largest fire of the history of the United States also burned right next to Paradise. And thankfully, the wind was just blowing the other direction, otherwise it would have burnt the town again. So it's a very important topic, and uh, and how do art? How can art also be a vector to transmit this information, this sensation, this? Uh, uh, real emotions of those people to more and so that we can actually take action or realize how do we how do we go from there um, so th in that sense that's why I want to I, I choose this label of speculative documentary because I want to turn it towards the future not just towards the past so uh, I'd like for everyone to feel something and and uh, I'm trying to ask more questions than that answer and I would you know, urge everyone watching photography or, or film or art in general not to take the artist position for granted, but to be cautious about what is the artist trying to do? Is it is he or she trying to answer things or, or, or leaving the, the room, the floor to uh, the story, to the people? And 
I tried the, my best to, to let them express that and to let them um, talk about their, their, their experience, uh, even writing some of their texts uh, to me on paper that they chose so that I could capture their own uh, story, not just try to, to impose my vision on, on, on what they had been through. So in that sense, I tried to, to um, mix the medium, the photography me medium, and. Um, let them express their voices, hence also my recording their, their talks and I'm building a film with it so that they, they actually, we can hear their voice, which has a lot more impact also and, and uh, power on, on, on us than just uh, watching a portrait. Were there any surprises in your, in your uh, adventure, in this human adventure of paradise? Did you feel that you went from ro one role to another as you met these people? And did your project transform into something else than you had or originally envisioned? Yeah, it's always difficult when you when you reach a place where people have suffered through immense uh, pain and uh, why do you go there and what are you looking for and are you a disturbance to them in their process of healing or are you actually helping? So in the beginning, um, I just went there, uh, um, I heard about that story and I decided to take a plane ticket and arrived there. I, I did some research but I didn't know anyone so I just walked the town or what was left of it and tried to meet people. Um, so in the beginning I was just asking them like would they tell me their story and what they are what they were feeling now and uh, I didn't feel very comfortable uh, reviving those memories because I knew it was a difficult uh, time for them. Um, but as time went by, I realized that I did not need to, to, to feel that, that kind of caution because they felt relieved or they were willing to tell me their story. Even some people were feeling forgotten by the state of California because after the emergency, uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency provided support for say three to three months to two years to some people who had lost all of their goods and houses and things. But afterwards, what happened? Nothing, like they have to take back temporary housing and give it to someone else for the next crisis, you know. And, and those people were left without money, without anywhere to go and where to live, and they felt completely left behind, or at least not listened to. So in a way, I was also playing that role, or that part of the ear to listen to their story, or the psychologist from, uh, you know, com coming from abroad to hear that. And some of them told me that after our many discussions, they had decided to go out again with friends and go to the restaurant and and start living again, not like being relieved by by all that uh, catharsis, you know. So it's. Uh, a very positive, uh, surprising discover that discovery that I had, and I was also feeling uh, confident and uh, validated in my process in a way that uh, yes, art, art, and those things that you can think are futile in the beginning are actually very helpful, even more so than material help sometimes. And beyond this role of, as you say, psychologist or healer, uh, which is which wasn't the original mandate that you had when you started. You chose infrared slide film. Can you tell us more about this choice and what you tried to convey through this specific artistic expression? Yes, it's interesting because this film has been discontinued many, many years ago. It was made by Kodak. It's, uh, it's an aerial film to, uh, to photograph um, either forest or ocean or military operations when in time of war to spot the different uh, tanks or, or troops because it reflects uh, some of the near infrared uh, that objects emit, which is not heat but closer to heat than visible light. So it reacts differently depending on whether it's vegetation or iron or building or clothes even. Um, so it, it, it's also linked to that process of aerial mapping when there are fires. You, they have those maps that, that show the spread of the fire and the destruction or the rebuilding or the, the untouched areas. But at the same time, this palette, color palette reminds the colors of the flames. And to me, it was an important uh, medium uh, using an instinct film for an instinct town and showing that, that uh, the fires that you could not see with your own eyes two years after the facts, um, and letting us feel more than just understand uh, what it does to actually live through a mega fire and uh, trying to 
show what they had still uh, on their retina, seared on the retina many years after the, after the fires. Because whenever there is smoke in the sky, like there was during all of the summer 2021 mm. when I was there, they feel completely panicked. They cannot go to work. They have those PTSD, uh, very intense, you know, because uh, they have lost everything. So it can happen again. So it's a very difficult tension to show with photography just to show so it, it has to go through other ways and suggesting it so my choice was to appeal to those feelings and those sensations more than just the the, the pure uh, visual um, the, the descriptive um, the documentary photography uh, aspect and, and that's why I chose that slide film so you say that you'd love to leave the audience with more questions quoting Pascal what are some of the questions that you'd love people to have? It's, it's all about um, our choices and what do we do after, because crisis happen. It's, it's even more a human crisis than environmental crisis, uh, because there is no natural catastrophe. No, the environment takes care of itself. Um, so it, the forest uh, or the vegetation grows back very fast. It's surprisingly fast. Um, so what do we do next? What do what do we learn from this? Um, and uh, the choices that those people made, I'm not uh, questioning, I'm not judging, I'm just uh, letting them express them and express their view. I'm not asking for them to give me a specific answer, oh yes, we should not uh, do this again, or we should move somewhere else. It's everyone's choice, but then it's uh, for the viewer to also make up their own decisions. Uh, how, how do they want to change something if they want to change something? Um, so. That's many questions that you can find in all aspects of our lives today. How do we react facing those new conditions of existence? Do we still have Karina with us or not? Just to know if we can ask her a question. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. So something strikes me in the way that you both, Max and Karina, address the practice of art uh, in these conditions of, of urgency uh, and, and of a burning world, literally in, in your case. Um, you speak about art not being an accessory, uh, but being really essential in tying people together, and especially in creating a space when systems such as governments fail. Can you tell us more about your, your reflections on, on culture and, and the failing state and, and the space for, for action? Yes, I, I wanted actually to follow up on what Maxime said is that in Lebanon, the practice of contemporary artists since uh, post-war time was about how to document uh, war problems, social political problems, and how to address it in a um, critical way, because you cannot be uh, an artist and, and not be touched by a context. And Lebanon has had uh, many, many wars. Uh, let's not forget the July War of 2006, the bombing of Kana in 1996, the Palestinian uh, camps. Uh, we had so many, so many political events. And one of our exhibitions actually at the reopening is, addresses exactly this uh, topic. How, how can an artist document or react or create a an artwork that is, we call them here, a time capsule. And we have had even an artist who addressed her own trauma of the blast by swimming in the port two weeks after. She's a performance art artist. So she filmed herself floating in the water of the sea in front of the port, and she made a, a, um, an ingress in the water in this post-apocalyptic bit space as if you know, this idea of, of trying to find your marks after an apocalypse, trying to find your ways of functioning again in a city. And I, I really believe that the, the, the artists are, they express themselves in a very particular personal way, but they also can be very universal at the same time. It was very original to, to or weird to some people to think, how can an artist wanted to swim in the sea after the blast. But many uh, of our audiences yesterday were very much touched by this artist who suddenly 
when you are an artist, you're alone behind your own, in your own ideas and you exhibit them. You share something very personal. And this stage from something very personal that becomes universal, this is where the museum acts uh, an important role, giving those unique voices and perceptions of life and violence and personal stories, because of course in our exhibition we also addressed many uh, killings and bombings that the artists went through and the way they reacted to this. And many of my discussions with artists are always around this idea, how to keep the memory, how to share, how to create dialogue, starting from this artwork. Thank you very much. And that's a, actually a beautiful transition to our next guest, uh, who will speak about museums as safe spaces for the self. So yet another, another level of security in this world in crisis. Thank you very much, Sonia and Max. And of course, Karina. Thank you for joining us.